the only piece of the 40 page document that I actually need. Yeah, well, can you activate CD right now? <laughs> okay, I have some CD. <laughs> And even see a game on it. It just says like fifty ish papers. <laughs> the screens up there is a really nice thing. Yeah, that is that works really well. well I... <laughs> okay. All right. Um, I'm happy to welcome Justin Casper here for the colloquium talk today. Uh, Justin, as most of you know, perhaps, uh, worked at SAO for a number of years. Um, and uh, before Michigan made him an offer he couldn't refuse. Um, his undergraduate work, um, at some point in one's career, where one went to school as an undergraduate becomes unimportant. But I think actually, in, in Justin's case, it's interesting because um, he worked at the University of Chicago. He, he was an undergraduate at the University of Chicago. And he did his uh, undergraduate thesis with uh, John Simpson, um, who many of you may know was one of the pioneers in uh, uh, the solar wind studies, experimental studies of the solar wind. Um, he then did his PhD work very quickly at MIT. Um, with uh, thesis advisors uh, Lazarus, Lazarus, Melcher, and Bruno Coppi. Um, and then sort of was at MIT for a bit, was at BU Coast for a bit, for a few and, then we, and then we snagged you over here. Um, and uh, at that point, uh, the opportunity to propose an instrument for solar probe came about. And Justin had this notion that was um, irreverent at best, I would say, um, outrageous perhaps, that the best way to measure the solar wind was actually to peak beyond the heat shield. And um, there was no guarantee at the time of the proposal that, that, was, that anybody was going to view that as a reasonable thing to do. Um, evidently, they, some, we, you know, we convinced people, so that was good. Uh, it survived the first four orbits, so that's good. Um, and uh, I'm sorry. We only know about the first. Three. We only know about the first three. Okay, three orbits <coughs> and one one ongoing. But you know, doing doing things that that appear to be impossible is is one of the the great joys of being in science. And uh, this mission was this instrument on this mission. Um, looked from a distance as it was not really possible to do. But congratulations. Thank you. And uh, let's hear about what, what you have to say on this. Excellent. Thank you, Ed. <coughs> so I, I want to do uh, uh, a couple things here. Uh, Smithsonian was involved in a key player in the success of Parker Solar Probe, so I, I do want to give you a flavor specifically of work done here. Um, I'll try not only to reminisce a little bit about some of our experiences, ups and downs, uh, here, but uh, for younger people in the audience, um, I can't say that uh, I put myself in a path that should have succeeded, um, but I'll tell you some things that seem to have worked well uh, on the way to making this happen that, that you might find useful, especially uh, some things we did at the Smithsonian uh, that made this project possible. So uh, Ed's already mentioned some of this, but um, Parker Solar Probe will eventually go into 10 solar radii. We're at 215 solar radii at Earth. There's its trajectory on the right. Um, and uh, was there a little pointer? There's a yardstick behind you. Oh, it's good. It's called Matray. Okay. So uh, there's the sun, and that was Parker Solar Probe yesterday. Uh, it just made history again as the yet even closer object to the sun that's ever been uh, uh, done before. So it got into 28 solar radii from 35 solar radii of the first three encounters. It uses Venus to get closer and closer um, until in 2025 we have our closest approach at about 4% uh, of an AU. So these are estimates, but right now um, we're coming back out of that encounter. The front heat shield, the spacecraft, and the front of our solar probe cup are probably glowing a dull red, running at around 600 degrees Celsius. Uh, later on in the mission, uh, this instrument will get up to maybe 
um, 13, 1400 degrees Celsius, and it can still measure uh, hundreds of femtoamps in several milliseconds, um, enabling us to make some of the fastest measurements of the solar wind ever, which is very useful because we are plunging through the solar atmosphere really quickly. So we need to be able to do that. Uh, now, before I dig into this, I want to acknowledge uh, I'm just one person. There were hundreds of scientists and engineers and support staff across the country working on this mission and working on SWEEP too. Uh, in particular, with the technical challenges of the Solar Probe Cup, we have a habit of converting uh, external reviewers uh, into team members over time. So um, <laughs> we added on people from uh, APL, from Draper Labs. Uh, in particular, Draper wound up making some really significant contributions to the thermal mechanical analysis uh, of the design, Ball Aerospace, Moog CSA, uh, all these amazing companies around the uh, country had to chip in to, to help us make this happen. Uh, Probe's part of NASA's Living the Star program. It's led by Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Lab through Goddard. Um, and the solar wind electrons, alphas, and protons investigation, that's what we're leading here at the Smithsonian. Kelly Corrick is the head of our Science Operations Center and our project manager, Tony Case, is the instrument scientist for the Solar Probe Cup. Mike Stevens is responsible for the uh, pipeline production, and we have a bunch of researchers here digging in the data. Uh, and then the team spread out at many institutions, and this was a little family picnic we had a day before launch uh, in Florida. And, uh, you know, I, I really wish we could live in a world where we work nine to five, but a lot of our scheduling is set by Newtonian uh, dynamics in the solar system, and we just have, you know, DSN contacts at three in the morning. So it's it's a, a weird mission uh, to work on. All right, let me quickly bring you up to speed with some of the scientific motivation for Parker Solar Probe. Uh, and uh, first and most basically is uh, some very fundamental aspects of the solar corona that we don't understand. So here's a picture of the um, photosphere of the sun taken by the SAO built AIA telescopes on SAO. <laughs> It's yellow. Why is it yellow? Because it's at like 6,000 degrees, black body radiation. That's it, right? Well, is that really it? Well, when there's an eclipse uh, and your eyes adapt, the moon's blocking it, you see all this incredible structure coming out, uh, these rays. Um, and in Spanish, uh, uh, it looked like a crown. People called it the corona. Um, and so this is the name for the extended atmosphere of the sun. And the fact that there's a corona is a problem. If you look in this image, um, it, you see white light not because it's glowing invisible light. This is not black body radiation like the surface of the sun. It's simply Thomson scattered light from the surface of the sun scattering off of electrons. Look at the intensity as a function of distance. Not falling off very quickly. The scale height for this is at least one solar radii or longer. Now, if you were in the 1880s, you knew a little bit of thermodynamics and uh, uh, if you were you know, studying it. <laughs> and for a hydrostatic atmosphere, uh, density should fall off exponentially with the scale height. Scale heights given by kT over mg, where m is the mean mass of a particle, g is local gravity, t is the temperature. And even uh, a century ago, people knew the rough surface gravity of the surface of the sun. We all knew the sun was made of hydrogen. We know the surface was around 6,000 degrees. So you could calculate that h should be 100 kilometers, or like a th thin little onion shell that you could barely make out here. Um, and instead, it's 1,000 times larger. So we only have a couple knobs we can turn here. The corona can either be a thousand times hotter or it can be made of some kind of new form of matter that we can't detect on Earth that's a thousand times lighter than anything we've ever found. So everyone went with that and we called it coronium for about 20 or 30 years. Um, and no one was able to find it. Uh, there was probably like weakly acting coronium. No, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> And so in the 1930s, people started to learn about like mega Kelvin plasmas. Um, and we realized that what we were looking at was not uh, light matter, but actually ridiculously unintuitively un hot plasma, right? Sec uh, laws of thermodynamics, you know, this is the hot thing. Things should cool off as you get further away. Instead, the temperature jumps by 100,000 degrees near the surface. By the time you're out here, you're looking at temperatures of a million degrees or more. And, and minor ions are getting heated up if your iron, for instance, up to temperatures of 100 million degrees. So, so several times hotter than the core of the sun. Um, what on earth is able to superheat things like that? Um, now we don't have to rely on solar eclipses. Uh, we can look at movies like this, again taken by SDO. Uh, this is uh, extreme ultraviolet light at 171 angstroms, uh, iron at around a million degrees Kelvin. Um, and you see that the sun is surrounded by this high temperature atmosphere. You can see that that atmosphere is incredibly dynamic. 
Um, if we could look on the surface and see magnetic field, you'd see sunspots on either side here. These are loops of superheated plasma. Um, here you don't see a lot of plasma because it's just shooting up into space. And one of the many things that Eugene Parker is famous for is coming to the realization uh, in 1958 in his uh, first publication on the solar wind <coughs> that you can't actually have a stable million degree atmosphere around the sun when you consider the gradients of pressure and uh, gravitational force. Instead what happens is uh, a small perturbation of the solar atmosphere will cause it to lift and accelerate. It'll continue to accelerate, it'll break the speed of sound um, at one or two solar radii. Yes, there are sound waves in space, they're just very fast. Um, and by the time you're at uh, 1 AU, you have flows that are at maybe Mach 10 or 20 in terms of sound, uh, sound speed. Uh, maybe more interesting in a magnetized plasma like the solar wind is the Alfane speed. That's like uh, plucking a magnetic field line and a vibration travels on it. It's usually a little faster than the sound speed and it's still maybe um, 10 times the Alfane speed out at 1 AU. So if you had a, a hundred, sorry, if you had a 1 million degree uh, Kelvin corona, you get flows of around three, 400 kilometers per second. Um, Parker, no one believed this at first. Parker had, there's a big story, no, like no, the reviewers just completely trashed uh, the model. Like one of the reviewers was like, hey kid, <laughs> you know, why don't you like learn a field before you propose a theory in it? Um, and Chandra Shakar, who was the editor of AppJ at the time, came by and said, um, no one wants me to publish this, but no one can actually show me what's wrong with the calculation. So, you know, <laughs> we're going to publish it and there'll be a controversy. Um, and so people didn't like it. And then just within a few years, the space age begins uh, in, in the Soviet Union, Gringaus et al. In the U.S., Neugebauer, Benetti and others start launching spacecraft with plasma probes, not too dissimilar to what we're flying now, um, and establish that there is indeed a supersonic solar wind and everyone, oh, of course, uh, believes it. <laughs> Um, and the closest mission to date was the German-U.S. Helios collaboration, uh, which got into about 60 solar radii, or a little bit more than a, a quarter of an AU, uh, in the early 1980s. Uh, now, there's a lot that we do not understand about the solar wind. <clears throat> One is um, we don't actually see what Parker predicted, in the sense that uh, this is not a uniform, spherically symmetric flow. There, there are dense jets. There's fast wind flowing at like 1,000 kilometers per second plus. There's slow wind. Um, it's too hot. Uh, the electrons and the ions are at different temperatures, which doesn't make sense. Um, it continues to be heated as you get further away. So for instance, if I go to this plot uh, that kind of collects some measurements spectroscopically through remote sensing and then in situ with spacecraft <coughs> as a function of the log of the distant height above the surface of the sun, this was uh, put together by Steve Kramer. Um, you can see this black line is kind of a notional model for the temperature as a function of height, starting at the photosphere, jumping up through the transition region, uh, and then continuing to rise. And you can see it around one solar radii. Here's where things start getting really weird. The protons and then heavier ions start adopting very different temperatures. Those temperatures keep to rising. Then we don't have any data. Uh, and then we see the temperatures falling. And if you look at the slopes of this temperature falling, it's not cooling off adiabatically. Um, to make this slope as gentle as it is, the solar wind has to be heated even out at one astronomical unit. Uh, effectively enough to basically gram per gram, you could boil a cup of water in about eight seconds if you could heat it as efficiently as the solar wind's being heated out here. So something is taking energy from the sun. It's able to sustain it out into the solar wind and then deposit it and continue depositing it, maybe not quite as vigorously, you know, all the way out uh, at Earth orbit and beyond. So um, you can see the point of solar probe, <laughs> get in there and figure out what's actually going on, right? So a really comprehensive set of um, all, the fi all the fundamental properties of a plasma, electric field, magnetic field, thermal electrons, thermal ions, energetic particles, and, and fill in this gap and really see what's happening. Um, and then I'm happy to say, uh, this, is, this was what Probe was supposed to be capable of. Um, our uh, combination of power efficiency uh, and other factors now has actually enabled us to operate out this far, although at a slightly lower telemetry rate. So we, we're getting really nice overlap uh, with other missions. And if you remember your orbital dynamics, um, you move through um, your orbit really quickly when you're close to the central object. So it takes 11 days to go from here down to there and back out again. Um, 
this we're talking about many months of data. So the Parker Solar Probe mission is, I think, a completely different beast from what we proposed it to be. Instead of 26 separate 11-day samplings of the inner atmosphere, it's now a probe running nearly continuously, mapping out the entire connection between uh, the corona and the solar wind, which is very exciting. Okay, so how is that extra energy being transported? I don't know, but let me plant a idea that we'll uh, coincidentally come back to at the end of the talk. Um, so. I mentioned there are sound waves and there are a, a type of magnetohydrodynamic wave called a alphane wave in the solar wind. Alphane waves are nearly ubiquitous. Uh, they were discovered uh, in the 1970s. This is the discovery paper, Belcher and Davis, basically confirming for, for the first time the existence of alphane waves. Now, again, what is an alphane wave? If you had a magnetic field line, you like pulled it a little bit and released it, you'd get a wave traveling along. Um, in practice, what that looks like to a spacecraft is you see um, coherent fluctuations in the magnetic field and the velocity. So this is the radial component pointing away from the sun of the magnetic field and the velocity. I don't know which curve is which. The point is they uh, are nearly perfectly correlated. Um, and if you look at the magnitude of the magnetic field, the magnitude of the density, there's no compression. Um, and these are some of the key signs of an alphane uh, wave. And you can take the magnitude, uh, the relationship, uh, of the magnitude of these fluctuations and calculate the alphane speed and all sorts of other things. So, <clears throat> I have good news and I have bad news. These alphane waves are almost always seen in the solar wind and they carry an incredible amount of power. So that's very good, or I should say they carry an incredible amount of energy. So they're a potential energy source for this protracted heating of the corona in the solar wind. That's good. The bad news is pure alphane waves don't dissipate. They travel forever. Um, and you can try to throw in a little bit more physics and describe that a little more, more accurately and, and get them to dissipate, but it doesn't happen very quickly. So at a minimum, these alphane waves need to convert into something that dissipates more efficiently, uh, or we're missing some piece of physics about how alphanic fluctuations get down to small scales and dissipate. Uh, now, why do we need to get closer to the sun to figure this out? One, I said, um, we just haven't seen data there. Uh, so we need to collect it. But there are a couple other important things. Um, this is height above the surface of the sun. This is a parameter uh, we call plasma beta, which is the ratio of the thermal pressure of the plasma to the magnetic pressure. It's also the ratio of the square of the sound speed to the alphane speed. So if it's less than one, the alphane speed is, uh, is larger. Um, and out in the solar wind, beta crosses unity, which is one reason why all the math is hard. You can't approximate it as one way of dominating over the other. We think as we get closer to the sun, beta is going to get uh, small. Um, and that means there could be a whole range of instabilities and interactions and processes that are occurring that we just don't see normally in the uh, plasma and interplanetary space. And maybe that's why we haven't identified the physics responsible for the energy transport and the dissipation. I'm also going to point out another thing. So this is a just totally schematic line of the speed of the solar wind as a function of distance from the sun, log scale, there's Earth. Here's how far we've gotten before. That's how close solar probe will get. Um, this is a just sort of crude notional sense of the alphane speed. And the point is just the solar wind speed, we believe, increases monotonically with distance from the sun. The alphane speed, we think, decreases monotonically. So at some point, it's got to go sub uh, super alphanic. All right, now why would you care about that? Like I said, the alphane speed is usually larger than the sound speed. So if I'm here and I scream in a magnetic wave, it'll make it all the way back to the surface of the sun. I'm still causally connected to the corona and to the sun. Waves are rattling back and forth. Once I cross this point, I've disconnected, okay? One way to think about it is this is the solar wind, this is the sun's outer atmosphere. Here we're magnetically dominated, we're in like a, the the sun's magnetosphere, if you would. Um, also, uh, the nature of waves could be completely different within this region if they're able to reflect and travel. So one of Parker Solar Probe's objectives is to just get close to make measurements where they haven't been made before. More pragmatically, we want to get below that alphane point um, and see maybe if once we're in the sun's atmosphere, we're actually sampling a, a very different type of plasma physics. <clears throat> Again, just to plant a comment because it'll come up later. Um, uh, the alphane point's interesting for a couple other things. Uh, if you look at the plasma above the surface of the sun uh, here, 
You'll notice that it's rotating as the sun rotates. Why is that? Well, the sun has a really strong magnetic field, um, and that magnetic field's forcing the plasma to rotate as the sun rotates. Now, at 1 AU, we don't see that, right? If we did, the plasma would be rotating at you know, thousands of kilometers per second. Um, so at some point between the surface of the sun and 1 AU, that rigid co-rotation has to break down. Now, what's cool is we know it doesn't happen at the surface of the sun. It happens somewhere out here. Now, who cares? Well, this is one of the only aspects of the sun um, that the solar wind actually sets. So the solar wind doesn't set the mass loss rate of the sun. It doesn't account for the dominant energy loss, uh, the momentum flux, but it is the dominant way that angular momentum is lost by the sun. And the reason is if the plasma has to co-rotate out some large distance, it's carrying a lot more angular momentum. So when it decouples, a lot more angular momentum is transported away from the sun. And the um, spin down time from that angular momentum loss is thought to be around the time scale of the, the lifetime of the sun compared to other factors that would change the angular momentum. So we'd really love to know how far out from the sun do we see rigid co-rotation or, or really any kind of co-rotation. Okay. So I planted some seeds. Let's talk a little about the mission. Um, solar probe, more than 60 years in the mission at, uh, in the making at this point. Um, Ed mentioned John Simpson. <coughs> Simpson chaired a thing called Simpson's Committee, or I think it was actually called like Committee Number Seven or something like that. Um, and they were tasked uh, by the federal government to propose what kind of instruments would you fly in space to do like geomagnetic and solar science if you had the opportunity. And this is one of the best examples I've ever seen of exceeding your statement of task uh, in a committee assignment. Uh, they came back and they not only recommended instruments, they recommended an entire line of missions. Um, Van Allen was on it too. They recommended a mission to look for trap radiation uh, in Earth's magnetic belts, um, a Ulysses-like Ulysses polar mission, um, and a solar probe and several other missions. Um, and in fact, every single one of those missions has since been implemented except a uh, solar probe. They also recommended that there should be principal investigators uh, from universities that lead scientific investigations instruments, and they shouldn't be provided by the government. The original plan was just to have the government supply data to us, and we'd have no idea how the instruments worked. So I think it was a, a good thing that philosophy was adopted. Uh, okay, so 40, 50 years then pass, and people look at different concept studies. There's a science and technology definition report or some assessment or decadal survey recommending solar probe, and it's impossible, and then it's possible, but it's $40 billion, then it's $20 billion, then it's $10 billion. Uh, and finally, um, in around 2007, um, a report came out with some modifications to the design. Venus gravity assist, solar panels instead of nuclear power, uh, a couple other tricks that made it cheap enough uh, only $750 million uh, that it was given the authorization to proceed. And in the end, the life cycle cost was about $1.53 uh, billion. Uh, instrument selections happened in 2010, 10 long years ago, 10 short years ago, and we launched in uh, 2018. <clears throat> and uh, I'll just very briefly say, I won't read this all, but uh, Probe has three pretty clear overall objectives. Trace house energy is flowing with distance from the sun between the electromagnetic fields and the particles. Try to line up what we see with structures back at the sun to figure out where the wind's coming from and try to understand how energetic particles radiation is being produced uh, close to the sun. Now, uh, here's the evolution of the spacecraft design. And I mean, I think you could write an entire book on some of the awesome early solar probe <laughs> concepts. <coughs> it was originally gonna go into four solar radii moving at like 0.1 C uh, for a like 10 hour encounter. Um, after having flown out to Jupiter, it had three plutonium power supplies. It was going to last, survive one encounter, and it had this like massive curved thing that was going to double as a heat shield and the transmitter because they assumed the data might, the spacecraft might not survive, so the data had to somehow come back in real time. Impractical. Uh, this was from around 2000. This awesome conical shape, like like a reentry vehicle, but let's make it massive again with the RTGs. Um, this was around when I first heard about probe. Uh, I, I helped my advisor in grad school uh, propose a couple Faraday cups, uh, which you'll see uh, a little bit about um, for a concept there. NASA reviewed the proposals, but in the end decided, I, I think it was too expensive and never announced a selection. 
Um, they formed another committee five years later, and they came out with this, uh, this roughly this design. This was the design at uh, CDR, Critical Design Review. <coughs> um, this is the very last photo of probe we ever took right before the payload fairing went on. There's our solar probe cup up there. Um, there's some of our other instruments. Um, it launched on a Delta IV Heavy, which is the largest rocket we have in the U.S. Um, the spacecraft only weighs 600 kilograms, so you, you could practically lose it within the payload fairing. It's so tiny. This thing's meant to fly, you know, giant public school bus-sized uh, spacecraft in low Earth orbit. Um, how did they make it cheaper? Instead of these kind of crazy elaborate heat shields, they came up with a simple design for um, like 10 centimeters of carbon foam uh, with a basically alumina or sapphire uh, coating uh, deposited on the front, um, graphite, um, fiber graphite on the, on the back, um, radiators, solar panels instead of plutonium, uh, water pumps through the solar panels to keep them from melting near the sun and then it's cooled off in these radiators. Far from the sun, uh, the water is heated so it doesn't freeze. So the spacecraft's like a warm-blooded animal. It regulates its own temperature. <laughs> Uh, and this happens completely autonomously. You might have heard Kelly mention we had our perihelion at 28RS yesterday. We don't know if we survived. Um, we, the spacecraft once a day sends a beacon tone. If we hear E, everything's okay. If we hear E, one thing's gone wrong. If we hear ah, something's gone horribly wrong. And that's all we know. It, it, it has three flight computers that vote on things. Um, it decides what to do. It can fire its own rockets to dump angular momentum. It regulates the solar panels. It's all fully autonomous. Um, and, and one of our headaches has been that our instrument suite is also incredibly autonomous. So we've had to give it, you know, we have to upload very elaborate commands and sequences to time things. Um, anything else I'll say here? No. Uh, in the Q&A, if you have any questions about the spacecraft, I will, of course, happily talk your ears off. So uh, spacecraft has a, a really awesome complement of instruments. Thermal plasma that we provide through SWEEP electromagnetic fields from basically DC to tens of megahertz, energetic particles, uh, and an imager uh, that can watch uh, plasma flowing past us. And so if you look on the side of the spacecraft, it's like bristling with sensors and instruments. And then up at the front, we have the tips of the electric field sensors, and then the solar probe cup are the only things that actually look straight at the sun. Everything else, uh, back here, we actually have survival heaters on at closest approach. Uh, our instruments are so cold. Um, so it's a pretty nice, benign environment back there. Okay, this is uh, some baby photos of our flight instruments for Solar Probe uh, from the sweep investigation. So this was the spacecraft before a giant acoustic test, which I'll get back to later. Um, here is that It's Impossible Solar Probe cup uh, seen from the side. And I, I think if you take a look at it, and I'll show you some higher resolution images, you'll gain an appreciation for sort of everyone's reaction when they see it. Like, that thing is terrifying and should not work. Uh, <laughs> like, basically, like, blood, sweat, and tears went into, like, every little square centimeter of this thing, uh, figuring it out. And I'll, I'll touch on some of the technology we had to develop. Um, but this part stares straight out at the sun. It's made of alloys you'll only find in rocket nozzle engines, nuclear reactor fuel rods, uh, can with afterburners for fighter planes that can withstand very high temperatures. These are custom high voltage cables. There, there are no normal dielectric cables that can survive. This runs at 1,000 degrees C and can, has been tested up to, I think, 10 kilovolts. Um, so the insulators are synthetic sapphire crystals, custom grown to the shapes we want. Refractory metals run through the center, uh, encapsulated in metal that's then laser welded together because um, you can't solder. You can't have screws, you can't epoxy anything, right? Uh, back here, uh, this is our connection to the spacecraft. Here's our electronics box. Um, you'll note these gold boxes here. I'll return to those gold boxes later. Okay, so, you know, I should be telling you about all the amazing science, but since we're here at the CFA, I want to talk about uh, sweep and, and the cup a little bit more. Um, so here's a, at least an aesthetically pleasant photo of the cup. So. Ed mentioned a little bit of this history. So as a grad student, I, I worked a little bit on ideas for cups for uh, the, an earlier solar probe concept. And then uh, this report came out. Like, we finally found an affordable way to do it. Now, how did they make it affordable? Lower risk, simpler operation, 
no Faraday cup, no plan for any instrument looking at the sun. And what's problematic to me is if you look at those movies of the sun, stuff's flowing away from the sun generally, not sideways. Now, solar probe is the fastest object we've ever made. Uh, at closest approach, it's moving around the sun at around 200 kilometers per second, uh, nearly a quarter million miles an hour. Um, so what winds up happening is that uh, if the solar wind's only flowing at 300 kilometers per second, you're moving sideways at 200, it should be coming in at a big angle. So the idea was, well, when we're really close to the sun, it'll come in an angle and an instrument in shadow will see it. Um, but we really didn't like that. What about when we're far away from the sun? What if it's not flowing the way we expect? Well, we really need an instrument um, that'll be able to survive. So I've been thinking about this for a while, but I'm a physicist by training. I am not an engineer. I am, I'm not a material scientist. Um, I felt that it should work. And this was, this was the moment for me. Um, one, Faraday cups are just the simplest thing you could imagine. There's a bunch of metal grids. At, at least one of them's insulated, and you put it at a high voltage. Particles either have enough energy to make it or they don't. If they can, they hit a metal plate in the back. You measure the current, and that's it. Like You measure the current versus voltage, and you make a, that's a map of the ions. We're a little fancier. There's actually four plates back there, so we can determine the angle the wind's flowing at. You look at that scan, you can back out the temperature. Uh, but it's a very simple instrument, and you'll note there's no electronics in here. It's passive, right? So we can back off and put the electronics here. But can it survive temperatures of you know, 1,000 degrees C or higher? Well, vacuum tubes work, right? I mean, vacuum tubes glow. They're so hot. They can, uh, people use vacuum tubes very successfully to like, control and regulate weak uh, currents. Uh, so I felt like, OK, you know, if vacuum tubes work, I think um, we can actually build something uh, that will operate at these uh, temperatures. <clears throat> now, uh, Mark Freeman, a thermal engineer uh, at CDP, uh, generated this simulation of uh, our closest approach, sort of worst case prediction for perihelion. Uh, and you can see now with a detailed model, like we're getting up to something like 1,500 plus uh, degrees Celsius in the worst case. <laughs> These are the melting points of the elements. Okay, and so you see our problem here. Um, that's, that's like 15, 1,600 degrees Celsius. Rule of thumb, you don't design something to operate at its melting point if you want it to stay together, right? Um, in fact, if you look at this, you'll see there's like 500 degrees C gradients in several centimeters. There are... Um, million pound per square inch pressures acting on this thing at closest approach. The, the strains uh, are, are almost unimaginable. So we need something far away from its yield strength, forget you know, anywhere near melting. So you're looking for things with melting points, you know, 1800 C uh, or higher. So that's yellow. So basically, all you've got are the refractory metals. Um, and so I had, there was a great um, announcement from like the Department of Defense a couple years ago. Here are 15 materials that if someone is trying to purchase them, they're probably up to no good. And we use all of them pretty much. <laughs> um, so we use tungsten, uh, hafnium, uh, rhenium, molybdenum, niobium, zirconium, uh, all, all sorts of uh, very rare materials and then mixed into very exotic uh, alloys. <coughs> so, okay, vacuum tubes work, but how do we actually convince NASA that this thing's going to survive. You know, a vacuum tube works, but what about a vacuum tube exposed to sunlight being hit by particle radiation? Is it going to break up or not? Um, so I had the gut sense that I thought it would work. There were people I was working with that were supportive of it. So how do we convince NASA? So I did what anyone should do. I went to Roger Brissenden, uh, who was our <laughs> division director at the time. And I was like, look, Roger, and I was, I'd been here for, I think, two years at that time. Uh, and, and had worked on some other proposals. So I, I knew the NASA proposal process. I was like, look, I just think it's tragic that this, um, this mission might not have this kind of instrument. I'd been approached by the mega team that was proposing for everything, and they were adamant that they weren't going to propose it. So I was like, I know it's crazy, but I'm very confident no one else is going to propose this. I think it's essential, and I think we can make it work. So. If we can propose it and, it and we look credible, I'm pretty confident we'll be selected, at least to do like a, t a demonstration and maybe we don't make it or not. Um, but I, I think the odds of selection are very high. And so 
uh, we talked a little bit more, well, who are your competitors, like, what's the design like, and, and Roger, you know, nodded, and he said, okay, let's, let me introduce you to Steve Murray, and we got up, we walked all the way over to Steve's office, we did the exact same thing again, and, um, oh, and I had a plan. Uh, a French colleague of mine had uh, shown me a place we could test uh, some of this stuff to show it would work. So I pitched to Steve and Roger, you know, let's build some initial versions of some of the key components and let's test them to see if they can survive. And we put that in the proposal um, and we'll do it. And, and I walked out with like 30 or 40K. I'm sure now there's a very formal proposal process. Um, but they were very supportive of this. Um, and why is that important? Two things happened. I went to a large collaboration meeting a couple <laughs> weeks later where I was invited to present to maybe be part of a big team. And people were like, well, we're trying to do this, we're trying to do that. Just in those three weeks, David Caldwell, Mark Freeman, and others at CDP, we had preliminary mechanical drawings, we had a test plan. I put that down, I talked about all the engineers we had at SAO. I came back to the Smithsonian a couple days later and I said to Leon, um, hey, they asked me to PI the sweep. So instead of like a $20 million instrument, like can I PI like a $70 million instrument suite as a 30-year-old? I, I guess, maybe. Uh, but they saw the institutional backing and that gave me that extra credibility and that, that made a huge difference. So then what did we do? We had a terrifying year because the AO came out. We had to write the whole proposal, but we had to follow through in our tech dev plan. So. Um, one of the things we did is we made an early grid. It doesn't have the transparency we wanted. It's not big enough. It's too thick. Um, but it's a grid. So can it survive? So uh, long story short, another lesson, like talk about what you're trying to figure out with your friends because you never know what they know. And so a French colleague of mine heard me complain, like I've got this great idea, but I don't know how to convince NASA. He said, come to Perpin Young and I'll meet you there. I want to show you something. So a few months later, I'm in Perpin Young drive up uh, into the mountains, the Pyrenees, and he takes me to the largest solar furnace in the world. So this is a mountain covered in steerable mirrors. This is not a fisheye lens effect. This seven-story tall building is shaped like a parabolic focusing lens with 10,000 individual tunable mirrors. A tower here, water-cooled steel doors, 10 megawatts of sunlight, a vacuum chamber in that tower with a particle accelerator that can simulate solar wind particles, uh, more than enough light to simulate a close encounter with the sun, mass spectrometers to see if anything's being lost or ablated, uh, fancy, sophisticated scanning uh, pyrometers to measure the resulting equilibrium temperatures. Um, so this is perfect. You know, how much is this going to cost? How am I going to convince Charles uh, to, to let us borrow this facility? Oh, it's pro bono. No problem. What are you talking about? And so they told me in the 1970s when probe was discussed, we wanted to get involved. And so we talked to NASA and we agreed to develop a extreme environment test facility to figure out if the instruments could survive in exchange for being on your science team. And then we developed all of this and they do other things here too. But um, this whole team was just waiting for a, a PI to show up and no one had remembered. <laughs> um, so, so this was all free. We, we shipped materials over, they did testing, they reported it to us. Every time we got test data back, it became like controlled information because none of us should actually know about the emissivity of 3,000 degree refractory metals, it turns out. Um, so it's interesting process interacting with them. Uh, but um, snowstorm shut the facility down and three weeks before the proposal went in, it cleared, it melted, they took the data, the thing survived. We put the plot in um, the proposal separately uh, a prototype of the cup we built and brought to Marshall Space Flight Center. We showed that it could actually measure particles. We put in a proposal and amazingly they selected us. And the selection statement basically said um, <coughs> um, an instrument has been identified that is essential to the success of the mission. It's not part of the straw man payload. Something else will have to be removed. That's a set of stories I won't get into. Um, but you sh we shall proceed. And so um, the next few years, um, we embarked upon this amazing technology development program. Shrink the electronics down, figure out how to get them to operate well, even at like 70C. Figure out how to make tiny uh, precision meshes out of uh, refractory metals. Figure out how to actually assemble this thing. <coughs> There's a cross-section of one of our high-voltage cables. You can see the sapphire capillary uh, 
little sapphire insulators um, and the uh, outer conductor that would be laser welded in place. And so by the time um, our critical design review was coming up a couple months before the mission critical design review, life was good. <coughs> and then I'll just show you one of our little left hooks. We got a um, email or a phone call like two days before one of our final reviews before we had our instrument critical design review. And here's the problem. So this is the spacecraft that launches on a Delta IV Heavy, a big rocket. Um, we knew what the loads were of the rocket pushing up. What no one appreciated until they did an acoustic test with a prototype of the spacecraft structure is uh, if any of you have a subwoofer at home for that really low base fidelity, okay, this is a 10 square meter sheet of carbon fiber. When you play the sound of a Delta IV launching, this thing induces something like 200 G's RMS fluctuations uh, into the cup. So we went from, yeah, <laughs> hands start so sweating just thinking about it. <laughs> so we go into our critical design review knowing that our electronics box would be dust uh, after launch and that the entire instrument would just shatter. Like, no way. <coughs> and so we had to actually get through um, the mission critical design review. And then I had to write a really fun letter asking for like a redo in a Delta critical design review. We brought in Moog, uh, this wonderful company that specializes in making your thing not break. Um, and we redesigned the instrument. And so I won't go through all the things, but I mentioned these gold boxes. Okay, so the electronics box is not firmly bolted to the spacecraft. It connects here and it connects here-ish on these kind of wishbones of thin titanium. Why do we have those? Well, when we launch, those 200 Gs of, of vibrational energy just start making the box rock back and forth in some, like, a few very large motion uh, modes. Each of these gold-coated containers is evacuated and full of a mixture of ceramic beads. The beads start rattling and they absorb the kinetic energy from the vibrations and damp it. So in the end, the electronics boards in here see a few Gs. Um, no one believed us. Uh, uh, when we propose that as a solution. Uh, this is why sometimes you just have to know when to give up and pay someone a lot of money. Uh, I, think, I think we gave Moog, we called Moog, we told them our problem. They said, no one ever comes to us at the beginning of a project. This is what we're here for. <laughs> <laughs> we gave them 25K and three weeks later they came back with a supercomputer simulation of this. Um, the biggest problem is the interface temperature here is 300 degrees C. So if you've ever seen people use like viscoelastic polymers, sticky rubber, um, it won't work in this environment. So we needed something that could survive at incredibly high temperatures. And they were like, oh yeah, we've done this before. <laughs> <laughs> I don't really get that, but okay. Um, okay, uh, final tests. So how do you actually convince people this thing is gonna operate over the long term? Um, <coughs> unfortunately, as fun as it is going to that solar furnace in France, they're the last French national lab with a permanent chef. Uh, they can only run for three hours at a time. Now you might ask, you mean seven hours at a time, right? Because the sun's up for at least seven hours. Well, um, they're like, you want us to work through lunch? <laughs> so um, what we just figured out we needed to do was come up with a um, way of illuminating the cup, exposing it to a well-regulated flux of sunlight, similar to encounter, while also hitting it with particle radiation coming through the aperture so we could verify they can actually measure the solar wind accurately um, at different distances from the sun. And we couldn't travel to Europe to do it. It didn't last long enough. And so <clears throat> the folks at CDP came up with just the most awesome contrived contraption you could imagine. And when we first mentioned it to APL and NASA, I, you know, they were like, I don't know about this. Um, but in the end, it was a, just a shockingly cost-effective <coughs> setup, and uh, a bunch of other pieces of hardware wound up using it to confirm they could work. So what did we do? We took this really long vacuum chamber from SDO, and we put a water-cooled giant window on the front. We bought four kind of imax -y film projectors. They each have a short arc xenon bulb that pressurizes to 30 atmospheres, runs at a brightness temperature of 6,000 degrees Kelvin, 
not a surprise, your eyes want to see visible light when you're watching a movie. Um, IMAX film projectors, I now know, the reflectors are transparent in the IR because why would you want to focus infrared heat on your film? Uh, so we had to redo the coatings. Uh, and then we had to figure out how uh, an IMAX projector diverges to cover a, a theater. We want a parallel beam of light. Um, and then we wanted to combine multiple parallel beams of light to reconstruct something about the angular size of the sun. The sun's like 15 degrees across the closest approach. Um, so we needed water-cooled mirrors, uh, and sorry, lenses, and then mirrors. And again, an incredible strength of the Smithsonian is we have some folks that are really, really good at designing telescopes, right? The light comes in, it gets manipulated and focused, and it ends up in a piece of hardware. We just said, run it in reverse. <laughs> Um, so they started with simulations using the same software um, uh, that we use for optical and UV telescope design uh, to propagate through this. Um, and then I'm going to show you a sequence uh, from a test we did there. And it was, you're going to see control panels, you're going to see us using safety equipment, you're going to see all sorts of stuff. Um, all of it developed here to make this possible while we were doing everything else. I, just an incredible amount of work. In, and uh, really impressive. Uh, before I show this video, I want to make an observation. Uh, in a big project, you really can't uh, try to do everything yourself. So, you know, it's a team effort. When I started out in grad school, this was my advisor, Al Lazarus, and here we are uh, at uh, Goddard calibrating uh, the uh, Triana Faraday Cup. Uh, <laughs> here, uh, like what, uh, more than a decade later, uh, this is. Uh, I, hopefully you all recognize Mike Stevens and Tony Case. We got a little giddy. This was like 2 in the morning, I think, and we were bored uh, trying to recreate the photo. Um, <laughs> but it was important to have a team here that um, you know, really dove into the details. And something I regret is not having the time to truly dive into the details of the cup the way Tony got to, had to. Um, so I'm going to show you a video based on footage we collected during the very last test we did to convince APL to make SPC, the solar probe cup, green and allow it to stay on the spacecraft for launch. This was three months before launch that we concluded our technology development effort. Uh, so all we had to do was take this poor version of the instrument that had been through hell and um, um, see if it could survive. Now, uh, two caveats. Uh, one, the University of Michigan kindly put this footage together, so it won't mention the Smithsonian, so you'll all be like, boo, I'm sorry. Um, and then, uh, unfortunately, you can see that Tony's doing all the work, but I'm doing all the talking. Shh, sorry. <laughs> all right, and, you know, I should have checked if sound was working. Dean? Oh, oh, it is. Sweet. Okay. Hold on. Let me just... Dean? Oh. Come on. Oh, no. I don't have the video. Uh, I don't have an internet connection. Uh, okay. I'll, uh, I'll see if I can get this to play later, or maybe we'll send uh, uh, the link around. I, I'll just say um, the point of the video is nothing worked right. Uh, we were scrambling, uh, and in the end, we finally got the instrument on. Everything worked beautifully. And I think that those like 15 minutes of chaos was a very nice uh, uh, summary of what the experience was like for uh, a decade. So just three months later, we had our launch. And, uh, 10, 9, nine start, 8. eight. Seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Liftoff of the mighty Delta IV heavy rocket with NASA's Parker Solar Probe, a daring mission to shed light on the mysteries of our closest star. It catches the sun. on fire on purpose when it takes off. That was a really fun launch. I highly recommend uh, using Delta IV heavies. <laughs> Just about 30 seconds into the launch was when my four-year-old son said, Wait, bring flight. the rocket back. <laughs> I can't, I can't. Uh, it was incredible. Uh, it was really fun to watch. Uh, we were able to see the main engines burn. Take the pressure on the core booster. It's uh, throttling down to the partial thrust mode. Uh, pretty shocking. This is the, good. if you're a rocket aficionado, this is the highest C3 object we have ever uh, thrown out of. Now 50 so seconds into flight. Escaped Earth orbit with a larger good in the full uh, excess uh, speed looks good than anything in the, uh, else. Partial thrust uh, even more than the new horizons. Now one minute. Okay, so uh, this was not enough to um, get us close to the sun, though. We actually also use a set of uh, Venus gravity assists. Uh, 
Um, okay, so now what I want to do is just very quickly show you uh, a couple of the science discoveries. So just let me put things in context. This is the solar cycle sunspot number with time. You are here in a solar minimum, which is kind of a nice time to start exploring the sun. Um, this was uh, what the sun looked like during our first encounter with the sun, with us coming here-ish, we think. Um, here is kind of that data and other data turned into a map of roughly what the radial component of the magnetic field should have been uh, close to the sun. And this black line marks the flip from inward to outward polarity. And we spent all our time down here. So the magnetic field when we're close to the sun below a quarter of an AU should have all been pointing in towards the sun. <coughs> These are raw solar probe cup measurements. Um, I'm not going to go into them in detail. I'm just going to point out, like, this is the proton distribution. So fitting the uh, Maxwell into peak lets you pull out the, the bulk properties, the velocity, density, and temperature. Um, here is a summary of the data from the first encounter. So. This red line is the radial speed of the solar wind. Um, this uh, marks perihelion at 35 solar radii. Here's when we drop below a quarter of an AU, and here's where we popped out. So that's 11 days from red triangle to red triangle. Um, the black line is <clears throat> the strength of the, uh, mag the total magnitude of the magnetic field. The red line is the um, <clears throat> radial component. And if you just remember that the magnetic field is divergenceless, you'd expect the radial component to vary as 1 over r squared which would roughly go as this uh, dashed envelope. And indeed, the minimum value, remember it's negative because the <coughs> radio field's pointing back in towards the sun, um, it hugs this envelope. So uh, good news is we were generally in inward pointed magnetic field. It, it grew in magnitude about as we were expecting. Um, the problem is it kept jumping backwards. So tens of thousands of times uh, the magnetic field uh, that we observed at the spacecraft would suddenly and violently flip polarity, um, and then it would flip back again. Now, you can't see it here, so what I'm going to do is just another version of it. Oh. Well, first let me comment on the, on the overall field, and then I'll show you uh, what it looks like close up. So if you remove all those spikes in the magnetic field, uh, you get this uh, you know, overall trend, which matches pretty well with what we were expecting. Um, and we're doing some interesting work mapping uh, the polarity of the magnetic field that we saw during our encounter. So if this was the sun, um, here's us moving around the sun. Uh, here is the polarity of the magnetic field that we saw with our instruments at, at, uh, near Earth. We're like lining things up and identifying like, oh, like here we were seeing the same stream. We can study how things are evolving. Uh, that's working very well. <coughs> um, this might not be too interesting unless you're an aficionado, but what was funny was um, we passed in the slow solar wind, and then when we got really close to the sun, it got really jumpy and spiky. Um, then we entered into faster and faster solar wind, which often has jumps in, uh, in velocity. We were very surprised to see very slow solar wind acting a lot like fast solar wind when we got close to the sun, kind of suggesting that... Um, um, I don't know, we're, we're seeing very clearly some multiple sources of the wind. I'm just going to jump to a zoom in of the fluctuation. So this is uh, about um, uh, 80 minutes of data near perihelion. Uh, and what I'm showing here is red is the uh, speed of the solar wind. Sorry, blue is the speed of the solar wind. Red is the angle of the magnetic field. Um, normally, it's at 180 degrees. It's, it's not radial. It's pointing in towards the sun. Um, and you can see that every time the magnetic field switches direction, the velocity spikes up, sometimes by hundreds of uh, kilometers per second. Uh, if you look here, this is the radial component and the other two components of the magnetic field and the velocity. They're highly correlated, just like the Alfane waves, Belcher, and everyone else since has seen in the solar wind. But there's some interesting stuff going on. They're organized into kind of coherent structures. So what we thought was going to happen was um, far from the sun, there's just this kind of random turbulent ocean of, of waves and fluctuations. And when we got closer to the sun, we thought the waves would be stronger. And they are stronger. The amplitude's a lot higher. Uh, but one of our discoveries is they're beginning to resolve into coherent things. So the solar wind will be incredibly quiet. Um, and then suddenly within seconds, the magnetic field flips around. The speed jumps by hundreds of kilometers per second. You're in this strange flow. And then for tens, hundreds of seconds, and then just as quickly, uh, it vanishes. 
uh, and here's now zoomed in looking at um, uh, 500 sec sorry, 1,000 seconds of data, and we're looking uh, specifically at one of these uh, velocity spikes or reversals of the magnetic field. So I'll just comment here on the radial component of the speed so you can see what they look like up close. Um, we see uh, uh, maybe 400 seconds were within this flow. It, the flows are very uniform. They're disturbed, but they're very uniform inside. It's a very simple, steady structure. Um, you can see here it's flowing about 150 kilometers per second faster when we're in there. Often what we see are these very dramatic oscillations uh, in velocity on one side or the other. We don't know if that's like the surface has a lot of structure to it or the velocity shears like shredding this thing apart. Um, but it looks like what we're seeing is those random alphane waves that we saw uh, that looked like an energy source, but we didn't know how to dissipate. Uh, we've identified a couple really cool things in our first orbits. They're turning into co often very coherent structures. So this, an event happened back at the sun, we think, that made this. Um, also, we're seeing things like these very dramatic oscillations on the side. Maybe we're seeing this thing ripping itself apart because it's not stable. So maybe we're identifying en uh, actual energy deposition mechanisms. So I think we're making incredible progress to hunting down um, you know, both what the mechanism is for releasing energy into the solar corona. I think we're getting some hints on very unusual and new ways that energy is being uh, uh, lost as this stuff travels through the corona. And we're going to be getting more than three times closer uh, than we have been uh, so far. So we're really excited to see how this is uh, uh, all going to evolve. I'm going to skip um, <clears throat> this net anatomy of the spike, and I'm just going to point out one more thing. Uh, I mentioned that the sun co-rotates, and we don't know how far out it rotates. If you look at the best models for angular momentum loss from the sun, Weber-Davis models, uh, they predict that out at uh, our distances, the solar wind should be rotating around the sun at a couple kilometers per second, which we were hoping to be able to detect. And this is the actual rotation speed we've discovered. So when we got closest to the sun in every encounter, we see a rotational circulation of the wind around the sun that gets up to around 50 or 60 kilometers per second. Um, this is crazy. I mean, if you just naively assume this is happening everywhere, um, the spin down time for the sun is 200 mega years. Uh, well, I don't know, it's a tenth. It's a tenth what uh, we predict. Uh, so uh, I don't think things are that bad. I mean, I, I assume we're going to go elsewhere and find things flowing in different directions or, or, or uh, somehow things will cancel out. Uh, but at least so far in all the encounters, uh, we're seeing incredibly large flows. So we at minimum have to figure out uh, how the sun is capable of creating a circulation flow, um, you know, an order of magnitude larger than our best models predict the magnetized plasma uh, can create. And if this is happening everywhere, uh, then we actually have a, a, and some issues with uh, how the sun is spinning down. Okay, so uh, I'm going to leave that there and just, uh, you know, enjoy the two minutes of questions. <laughs> yeah. okay. Thank you. I'm not quite sure. So can you go back to, because I think you mentioned when you were just talking about the transition from a slow to fast uh, to, right, 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 just, yeah, here. I, th I guess I hear that you said when you get to the closer to the sun, they get faster. Ah, ah. So, so what's interesting is uh, I skipped over something. So we're scanning across the surface of the sun during this encounter. So, um, here we're passing over and connected to a, a coronal hole. So we're seeing like normal fast wind coming from a coronal hole, which generally is full of waves. Here we were passing near um, the streamer belt, um, which, which is near the magnetic field reversal, and we see what looks like slow wind. Um, in between, um, we're seeing something that we've only very rarely seen uh, in the solar wind uh, at Earth, which is very slow wind. I mean, it, this is the slowest wind we've ever measured. Um, 
but it has an incredible amount of wave power. And so we're, we're not really sure what this is. Like, could it be at the edge of a coronal hole, you can get you know, wind with just as much wave power, but something went wrong and it doesn't get accelerated? Or is it slow wind and the waves are able to leak over better than our models say, and, and so you see some waves there? But we don't know. I mean, it's a great thing you caught. Like, it's, a, it's definitely a surprise uh, and I think a, a big question for us, like how you explain this. Kathy? So for the, uh, the figure you had with the, the rotation speeds, where you were finding surprisingly high yeah. speeds, do you know what, uh, what kind of structure you might have been passing through with like a streamer, a CV? Um, in some cases we were passing through, so this is cool, right? Um, in some of these cases we were passing through 600 kilometer per second coronal hole wind, and some of them we were passing through streamer belt wind, and some of them we were passing through that, that other wind. So we're, we're seeing the same rotational speed, even though we're going through wind that's flowing away from the sun at very different speeds and with different levels of waves, which, if you ask me, is highly suggestive of rigid rotation out to some distance, right? Because then it all only cares about the rotation rate uh, of the sun. Mike Stevens has some really cool results that might be related to this, which is, the plot I showed earlier on motivating the mission um, that had the Alphane point at 10 RS, like Mike's finding, if you, you look at the Mach number, that it might actually be out at like 25 solar radii. Probe might be a lot closer to the Alphane point than we realized. Um, and Mike even estimates like a 20% chance we cross it, crossed it yesterday. Um, so part of the issue might be that the the Alphane radius is a lot larger than our models predicted. Kind of depressing that we can't calculate N over B yes. successfully, right? <laughs> like, oh, the detailed physics is so important. Um, but uh, yeah, and then maybe if with the Alphane point being higher out, further out, the angular momentum and the rigid rotation is higher. If it really is the Alphane points out higher everywhere, again, there's a there's maybe an angular momentum um, problem. Accurately to what's going on back at the, at the at this surface of the sun? Accurately, yeah. Do you actually know which piece of the sun is producing what you're seeing out So I'm going to be completely honest. I really didn't think that was going to work. And we have a um, graduate student who tried that, you know, took the speeds that we, well, so he did a simple model where he just like looked at what we were above Measure, took the measured magnetic field strength, compared it to like what, what a measurement on the photosphere said, uh, or a little bit above the photosphere. <coughs> um, it didn't look so good. Um, then he called us, and we gave him the first look at the solar probe cup data, and he corrected for the speed of the wind, and then it looked really good. Um, so we're actually seeing like changes in the radial strength of the magnetic field that seem to be lining up pretty well with changes in magnetic features in the lower corona. We're also, we had a paper we submitted, we have 50 papers coming out, uh, I should mention, in APJ uh, in February, and we had the four papers in Nature in December. Um, thought. Oh, we just submitted another paper where a grad student is reporting that um, at, when we got very close to the sun, um, the very hot uh, high energy electrons, their temperature started jumping and changing as it looked like we were crossing from different regions on the sun to another. So we think we might actually be seeing encoded in the electrons like the coronal temperature. Um, so this is great because I, you know, I was a little nervous about, you know, us really being able to tie it to specific regions. This is why DKIST um, is really significant. I mean, if we can really say we think we're coming connect to the center of that coronal hole, DKIST, it doesn't have a huge field of view. It can look there and we can try to correlate um, you know, at the, at the finest scales. Um, and we've also had some surprisingly good success lining up with data we see at Earth, too. Not always, uh, but it's, it's working well. And when we get three times closer, I think the mapping will get even better. I was wondering if you have any residual uh, orbital maneuver capability such that, for example, there are other spacecraft looking at the sun they could see, for example, a big coronal hole, hole which you could make an adjustment to and go over. Is well, there any such so so we we good good news? We've got a ton of a ton more fuel than planned. 
as is often the case, right? You either blow up or, or you, you are conservative on your fuel. Um, so we've got a lot of extra fuel. Um, for big maneuvers, unfortunately, uh, there won't be any energy, there won't be any more Venus gravity assists after, after 2025. Um, the problem is, uh, and the answer is going to be no, <laughs> the problem is um, what happens is uh, like um, about a week before closest approach, our high gain antenna retracts behind the heat shield so it doesn't get melted. And then we're not in contact with the spacecraft anymore. We just get this transmitted, it omnidirectionally broadcasts throughout the solar system, this like, I'm all right. Um, <laughs> and so we're not able to uh, react in real time. The solar orbiter spacecraft, which is supposed to launch February 7th, um, will have more of a day-to-day -day commanding capability. So at least in that direction, like Orbiter's gonna try to, and, and it's bristling with um, imaging and spectroscopic instruments, try to like track what might be mapping to us and, and respond in real time. Yeah, but it's, it's kind of gut-wrenching. I mean, we can, go, we can go days and days without being able to talk to the spacecraft. I'm intimately familiar with like the weather in Canberra these days. <coughs> Other questions or comments? Was there a question up there? Yeah, I'm blinded, but speak. <laughs> yeah. I repeat the question. Yeah, so, so um, just in general, could I say some more about, the, uh, about them? Yeah, okay. So they're really strange. <laughs> uh, um, so we're we're at a we're really at a bit of a loss for what these we're calling them switchbacks or velocity spikes. Um, uh, we're at a bit of a loss for what these things are. So far, every easy exa explanation we've come up with hasn't hasn't borne out. So originally, we thought they were like the residual of like jets or spicules from the corona, but those seem to kind of unwind and not be able to keep the magnetic like why would the magnetic field keep twisted around uh, uh, this far out? Um, they do some really interesting things. They're, um, if you look, uh, it's not so obvious here, but if you, oh, okay, well, look here. So this is like the, this is the, did I repeat the question, by the way? No. Oh, okay, I'm so sorry. Could I say more about what the spikes are um, and the polarity reversals? So this is the component of the speed of the solar wind out of the ecliptic plane or equatorial plane of the solar system. And what you can see is when we enter one of them, the speed jumps up. Um, this flow deflection shifted by a little bit, and then we left. Now, that's a problem, because if there's some, like, oscillation traveling through the solar wind, I want it to, like, zig to the left and then zag to the right. Like, I should, you know, a wave should take me back to where I started. Um, and instead, these things are one-sided. And I'll be a little more specific. In the, like, eight days around closest approach, the first encounter, if we entered one of these switchbacks and the magnetic field uh, rotated by more than 40 degrees, it only rotated in the direction of the motion of the spacecraft around the sun, or the direction of this unexpectedly large circulation of the plasma around the sun. Um, we speculate that maybe these two are connected. <laughs> um, but what on earth creates like pulsations, you know, or, or, or these jets that are like polarized preferentially? That they're all they're all pointing in the same direction, and like we tried, we have a figure in the in the Nature paper to try to point this out. If this was the sun, this is sort of our best sense of what this thing looks like shooting out away from the sun. Um, the magnetic field line flips around, and it shifts over, and it comes down. In fact, on average, every time one of these flies by, after it's fly, flown by, fly by, after it goes past us, it's like the plasma shifted over by like 10,000 kilometers. So that's, that's really strange. Um, so is there some net torque that's like pulling on them, that aligns them? You know, are they coming from the left side of a coronal hole so they're all going in some direction, but somehow they make it all the way out? Or are they being generated, you know, an hour earlier right next to us and so they're all the same direction? We, we don't know, it's a big mystery. Could it just be rotating? Uh, but why would they align in the same direction? Yeah, unless they interact somehow and, and like have a memory. This definitely, by the way, I mean, this completely changes our models of like turbulent dissipation, what the turbulence is like, energetic particle propagation. Like now we know that all the radiation has to make it through 
tens of thousands of these kinks in the field line before they get out to 1 AU. Like that's going to change our cosmic ray propagation uh, models. It's going to change how the heat flux escapes from the sun. Uh, so this, I have a feeling we're going to get really sick of these things or learn a lot about the sun uh, from them over the next few years. But you're preferentially in the southern hemisphere of the uh, south of the equator. So far, every single time we've been south. And, and you can and you measure the three components of the magnetic field. Yep. So you know what what the magnetic helicity is. Is it the magnetic helicity dominant in these things? Is I mean, because we expect the poles, the different hemispheres, to have different helicity. There, there so isn't. There isn't much of a difference in the turbulence inside them versus outside. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. I will. I cannot wait until we have a cross on the other polarity side. Because like, if, if this all continues circling <laughs> the same direction, that's interesting. Yeah. If it flips direction, that's interesting. I don't know or want to hazard a guess or a prediction yet uh, which way it'll be. But either way, we're going to learn something interesting. We just have to wait for um, you know, the sun to the, cooperate. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. The orbit. Other questions? If you're up there, shout, because I could. I'm hearing none. Thank you.